Now, when I was asked to come and speak for these few nights on truth from the New Testament regarding the functioning of a local assembly, um, I must admit I struggled a little bit to know how to prepare. So I'm looking into your faces tonight, and I have no idea what you're expecting. I don't know. Um, there's likely some here that know far more about this than I do. There's definitely some here that have been part of a local assembly longer than I have. And there's many of you here younger than me. So let me just do a few things at the very beginning in terms of just laying out the way that I intend to approach the subject over the various nights. And I'm certainly open to input. Uh, if folks want to contact me uh, between now and next Wednesday, if there's things I say that you don't understand or things that you would like me to address, then I certainly don't have the answers for everything, but I'm happy to try to deal with things scripturally. First of all, let me say that I want to be very, very clear that this type of teaching should never come across as us versus them. My objective is not to put into your minds the idea that we are comparing the assembly of Christians that meets here in Sarnia Gospel Hall with groups of Christians that meet in various other places. That's not my objective whatsoever. I don't think we're given a mandate to pass judgment on various groups of which we're not part. So I'm not going to speak to you as sort of a, an objective observer from a distance, analyzing various types of congregations and different bases for gathering and tell you what I think of this one or that one or any other one. So in terms of comparisons, I would ask you to do the same. I'm really not looking at all to spend time comparing different places and trying to judge which is better than another. Uh, the comparison I would like us to focus on, and I would suggest to you, the comparison each of us as individuals need to focus on is comparing the place where I am placed by God, the assembly that I'm part of, the group of Christians I meet with, the place where God has put me to honor him. Compare that to the word of God. And that's what I would like to try to do in these sessions together is to look at the word of God and say, does it really matter how we gather? Does it matter how we function? Uh, are there any guidelines in the New Testament that stipulate how a group of Christians are supposed to meet locally? What's the significance of it? How are they supposed to function? Does it matter to God? That's the subject I'd like to deal with. The second thing I'd say is, I hope that nothing I say comes across as pride. So not only is it not a sort of a comparison of all sorts of different ways that churches function and trying to analyze them. But secondly, it's not only not us versus them, it's not us alone. It's not saying, here we are, we've got the truth, we've got this figured out, this is the only way to do it, and we've, we've got it sorted. Pride is both on a personal level and on a collective level, a tremendously dangerous trap when it comes to the testimony of God. So on a personal level, I think we all know, at least academically, maybe we don't know experience enough. But we know that pride is that element of our fallen nature that forms a part of almost every type of sin. So you get verses like a person who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall, and so on. But when it comes to assembly testimony, when it comes to congregational functioning and testimony for God, pride is actually equally dangerous. So when you come to Revelation chapter 3, for example, the last of those seven churches that are addressed, the church in Laodicea, the risen Christ puts his finger on their problem. They're proud. They think that they're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And yet he says, you don't know that you're naked and wretched and blind. And so you see there the danger of congregational pride creeping in. That we do this better and, and we've got this figured out. Dear brother or sister, don't allow pride personally to be a source of stumbling. And collectively, let us not allow pride. There's more than enough to keep us humble. There's more than enough to keep us with a keen sense of how much we fail. At our very best, individually and collectively, we only are what we are by the grace of God. And so nothing that I say over these nights should please be perceived that I'm speaking from a position of strength or pride, thinking that we've got something figured out. We seek to follow the word of God and we seek to follow it humbly. Thirdly, what I'd like to stress is I really want to try to focus on the scriptures. I'm going to be very simple. 
There's likely some here, and there's nothing I'll say over the next six nights that you haven't heard already. So maybe you'll leave very disappointed. But if there are some here, and you would really like to learn from the Bible, what does the New Testament say about how Christians are supposed to gather? And really, that's where I'm aiming, is to just honestly look at what the scriptures say. What does it mean to the Lord? Why did he lay out instructions for us? Is it important that we look to the New Testament, or is it just that we're left to sort of do whatever works, pragmatically, or whatever makes us feel good, or whatever seems to benefit the most people? So that's my, my aim, and my aim is to look at the scriptures. We won't get the answer to every controversial subject. If you're looking for me to sort of give you the top 10 list of controversies and weigh into them, you'll leave disappointed. That's not my purpose. My purpose, if I leave after six nights and people have a better sense of what the New Testament teaches about local companies of Christians gathering together, then we'll have accomplished our purpose. So in introduction tonight, there's really four things that I want to do. So the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about the whole idea of the word church, churches, or assembly. Uh, some will say it's just semantics, and, and maybe it is. But words have meaning, and words take on meaning over time. So someone asked me a very honest question one day. I was in Trinidad, and I was sitting, and they said, what's the difference between a church and an assembly? And I hadn't really thought of that question myself. Maybe you have that question. You know, you'll hear people often talking about going to church. You'll hear other people that will never hardly use the word church, and they'll say that I'm part of the assembly. Well, let me just explain the word. The word church, we read it in Matthew chapter 16. We read it in Matthew chapter 18. We read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The word church literally means a called out company of people. So an English word that would be similar would be the word congregation. Except congregation doesn't go far enough because congregation just has the idea of a group of people assembled together. The word church, or I, I never try to pronounce Greek words, so if you're better at it, you can call it ecclesia is the Greek word. The word has the idea of a group of people, but it's not just a group of people. It's a group of people who have been called out. That's the literal meaning of the word, a called out company of people. Now, the word church over the years took on all sorts of other meanings religiously. So even today, if I talk to you about a, a called out company of people, you might think that it's people gathered for a hockey game, or you might think it's people protesting against COVID regulations at Young Dundas Square in Toronto, or you may think it's a group of people doing a variety of things. But if I say a church, right away in your mind, there's some religious affiliation. There's some sense that this is something to do with religion. So the word church has taken on additional meaning beyond just the literal meaning of the Greek word, a called out company of people. Over the centuries, what happened is the word church gathered around it a whole bunch of additional baggage, right? And so there was the big organized universal church, the Catholic church, and then the Reformation came. There were split offs from that, and there were then churches that formed around the different beliefs of the reformers. And so the word church got to mean a whole lot of other things. It meant to mean, sometimes people mean it, use it to mean a building. They'll use it to mean an organization, a religious organization of some sort. So around, you know, however many, a hundred and something years ago, when there were a number of people who came out of some of the organized religions at the time, the word assembly became a popular word. So men like William Kelly, men like John Nelson Darby, those sorts of men, the word assembly began to be used. It's a word that means the same thing. Again, I would suggest it's a word that doesn't quite convey in English because it's not just a matter of assembling. It is the idea of being called out to assemble. But that's where the word assembly started being used. And the reason it was used was because it sort of differentiated from the misuse of the word church. Now, in today's society, they may be more or less interchangeable. And I'm not really terribly interested in that. I'm not here to tell you you must use assembly or you must use church or you must use either. I'm just explaining that the word church or the word assembly is really synonymous. Biblically, it has the idea of this called out company. Now, in the New Testament, Matthew is the gospel that introduces us to this word. 
And it's interesting that the first two times it's used in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, it defines for us the way the word's going to be used in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 16, and I'm not going to have time to go into great detail on this tonight, but Matthew chapter 16, the Lord Jesus refers to something for the first time. He says to Peter, you're Peter, and upon this rock, the rock that Peter had just confessed, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, upon this rock, notice that the Lord describes something he is going to do. I will build my church. And then he goes on to say that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And if you trace that truth through the New Testament, you will find that the Lord is referring to a work that he is doing in this era that we live in. It began after he returned to heaven following his resurrection, continues on to the present time, and it is going to end when he comes back. And the clock of prophecy begins again. God's judgment will come and eventually a kingdom will be set up. During this period of time, Christ is doing a work. And that work is described in Acts chapter 15. It says there that God is calling out. Remember that it's an assembled company called out people. Acts chapter 15, God is calling out from the nations a people for his name. And so very simply, the, the broad aspect of this congregation, this called out company of people, it encompasses every true believer in the Lord Jesus. From the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 until the moment of the rapture when the church is complete. And the word is used that way a number of places in the New Testament, especially the epistle to the Ephesians and the epistle to the Colossians. Now, there's a fair bit of misunderstanding around that. People will talk about the church on earth today. The Bible actually never talks about the church on earth in that broad sense. You know, people will say, well, every Christian on the globe right now, collectively comprise the church on earth. No, not really. Every believer presently on the earth is part of the church. But the church is really only ever going to be complete once. And that's at the rapture. So the first meeting, the first gathering of the church in its large aspect, its broad aspect, is going to take place when the Lord shouts, the dead in Christ rise, we who are alive and remain are caught up. And in that moment, the entire church, the entire called out company of Christians will for the very first time be complete, will be assembled. And they will continue eternally as the body and the bride of Christ. So that's the first way that the word is used. The second way the word is used is what you have in Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, in the context, it's quite clear that it's a congregation of people that's in view. This interpersonal dispute arises. They try to resolve it. It can't be resolved. It says you're to come and you're to tell it to the church. And for the first time, we have introduced this idea of a group of people, a congregation of people, a called out company, and a sense of accountability that individuals have towards that collected company. Now, that idea is going to be expanded as you move through the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, you're going to find in chapter 2, the first functioning local church of Christians, the first local assembly of believers was in Jerusalem, the end of Acts chapter 2. And as you go through the book of Acts, you'll see that in various places, the gospel was preached, people were saved, local groups of Christians gathered, and they became autonomous entities referred to, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as the church of God at Corinth. Acts chapter 20, Paul sends to Ephesus and calls for the overseers of the church at Ephesus. Paul writes a letter to the churches, plural. You can't use churches, plural, when you're referring to the one universal church. But Paul writes to the churches, which are in Galatia. And so the second way that the word is used in the New Testament is this idea of a local, geographically linked, people in a specific geographical area, gather together. It's the same word. So it's a company that is called out. Now, before I leave that subject, let me just come to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. 
Uh, some people say, well, you know, is it really a local assembly? Because, you know, local assemblies hadn't started yet. What's it doing in Matthew's gospel? Because Matthew's gospel is the gospel of the king. Matthew's gospel is fairly strongly focused on uh, a Jewish uh, flavor. So why would these verses be in Matthew's gospel? Well, I, I'll state and we'll talk about it privately sometime if you wish. Very clearly that Matthew chapter 18 is a local church that's in view. It's being described. Matthew chapter 16 is very clearly the universal church that Christ himself is going to build. Why is it in Matthew's gospel? I think one of the keys is the idea of the presence of the Lord. Matthew's the gospel that begins with Jesus described not as a savior, not even by the name Jesus, but by the name Emmanuel. What does the name Emmanuel mean? God with us. If you read through Matthew's gospel, the Lord Jesus is clearly presented as a king to the nation, the son of David. He fulfills all of the requirements to legitimately be the king of the nation. And he comes and he proclaims himself. And Matthew 5, 6, and 7, that great discourse, Sermon on the Mount, he lays out his principles as the king. But if you read through the gospel of Matthew, you come to chapter 11 and into chapter 12, and the nation flatly rejects him. As their king. In fact, chapter 12, they ascribe to him his works, that he's doing what he's doing through Beelzebub. And they take the work that the Holy Spirit was doing through the Lord Jesus, and they say, no, that's the work of the devil. And they completely reject this one who's the king. You go through the rest of Matthew's gospel, you'll find in chapter 13, there's a very abrupt change. And now it's not a king presenting himself to an earthly people. But in Matthew chapter 13, you have these mysteries of the kingdom. And you have this idea of a much larger program that's being laid out. The Lord is now moving away from just presenting himself to the Jews, to the nation of Israel. And he's speaking now about a much broader work that is going to be done. Significant then that in chapter 16, he actually leaves Jerusalem and Judea. And he goes up into a Gentile area, Caesarea Philippi. And when he's up in Caesarea Philippi is when he asks Peter, who do men say that I am? And it's in that context that the Lord first introduces this idea that he is going to be doing something different than what had been anticipated previously. He wasn't now presenting himself as a king to Israel. He says, I am going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Then when you come to chapter 18, you have the second aspect, this local aspect. Now, I owe it to Dave Valance, who pointed this out for the first time. Maybe others pointed it out before, but for the first time I heard it. Matthew 18 and verse 20, you have the little word where. Where two or three are gathered together in my name. The word that's used there for where is only used three times in Matthew's gospel. And if you look at the other two occurrences of it, you get a little picture of a local church in principle, the way it's meant to function. And the idea is that this gathered out company, if you look at the language of Matthew 18 and verse 20, the best way to translate it in English would be this, where there, wherever there are two or three, so where there's a plurality of people, having been called out, so wherever there are two or three, having been gathered unto his name, the idea of a magnet. It's the idea of attraction. It's the idea of people who are responding to something that is attracting them. And as you look at it now, there's a group of people, they have been gathered, they've been called out, and there's something that has attracted them. Now, the other two places the word where is used. First of all, it's used concerning the wise men when they came from the east. And in Matthew chapter 3, at the very beginning of the gospel, it says, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now you think of that scene. They're following a star. If you or I had been there, I mean, whether it was three wise men, we don't know. Uh, we don't know how many there were. We know there was more than one. But it's just, you know, the little tranquil scene that they draw up at Christmas, at Christmas time. You see these wise men from the east with their gifts. What had attracted them? What had drawn them together? We see them now, they're gathered together. Where are they gathered together? Where the young child is. 
So Christ is the one who is there. He is the one that has attracted them. He is the one around whom they are gathered, and he is there in their midst. The second time the, verses, the, the word is used is at the very end of the gospel in Matthew 28. Verse 16, And the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. They went to a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. So now it's not the little baby, or the young child actually, the young child back in Matthew 3. Now it's the risen Christ. He's risen from the dead. He told the disciples to meet him in Galilee. And so here they are, this group of people. And we see them and they're going up to a mountain where he had appointed them. And what, what's the scene? People that have been attracted, people that have been gathered, people that have come together. Why? For him. And he's in the midst. And with him in the midst, when they saw him, they worshipped him. So that's the picture that we have in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. There is a presence that is promised. The Lord Jesus says, where there are two or three that are gathered together unto my name, there I am in the midst of them. So that's the first thing I wanted to cover is this idea of the word church or the word assembly. How is it used? It's used in two ways. Lots more could be said, but we'll leave it at that. The second thing I wanted to cover in introduction tonight is this idea of the house of God. We read in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, a very significant scriptural term used to describe a local assembly of Christians. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, I hope to come to you shortly, but if I don't, I'm writing this letter to you so that you will know how a person ought to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, this little expression, the house of God, is now used to describe in the New Testament a local assembly of Christians. You'll say, well, why is that significant? This idea of God dwelling among his people, the house of God, is the theme that runs right through the Bible. In the Old Testament, the first time we read of it would be in the book of Genesis, chapter 28, when Jacob uh, sleeps on that pillar, on the pillow of stone. And when Jacob comes to, after the vision that he saw, Jacob says, surely the Lord is in this place. And he says, this is a terrible place. And then he names the place Bethel. This is the house of God. And what gripped Jacob there personally in Genesis 28 is that the presence of the Lord is in this place. This is the dwelling place of God. This is the house of God. First time it's mentioned. Probably the most prominent mention of this idea, the house of God, this designation, is the tabernacle. And that's why I read where I did in Exodus chapter 25. If you read the story of the journeyings of the children of Israel after they come out of Egypt, and even after they go into the promised land, one of the most prominent features of the life of the children of Israel during that time is this building, this tent, this temporary thing that was set up and taken down and set up and taken down as they traveled through the wilderness and eventually set up and left up for quite a while once they got into the land. We call it the tabernacle. The Bible calls it the tabernacle. It's called frequently the house of God. And so what I'd like to just draw your attention to a little bit is what does this expression, the house of God, mean when it comes to a local assembly? Well, just a, a few things. Let me just say before I go into this too far, there is a fair bit of misunderstanding about the teaching of the tabernacle and whether or not it has any relevance to the functioning of a local assembly. And there are people who will uh, err in one direction and try to take all sorts of details out of the functioning of the tabernacle and bring them into the functioning of, of a church or an assembly in our era. And so looking outside, you can say there's many of the religious trappings, priests with robes and bells and incense and all sorts of other things that you can trace back to the formality and the functioning of the priesthood and the tabernacle in the Old Testament. So no, that's wrong. Then there's people though that'll err in the opposite direction and they'll say that the tabernacle has nothing to do with a local assembly. In fact, everything to do with the tabernacle 
is actually fulfilled individually in the New Testament. The whole idea of sacrifices and offerings and a priesthood and approaching God and all of that, the book of the Hebrews clearly makes, makes, it, uh, makes, it, makes it clear, can't clearly make it clear. The, the epistle to the Hebrews clearly states that all of those things of the tabernacle, the offerings, the priesthood, they all find their fulfillment in Christ. And therefore, we don't have a priesthood that functions as an intermediary between us and God. We have one sacrifice offered forever. And you say, yes, absolutely, that's true. So that means that the functioning of the tabernacle, all of the ritualistic things and all of the ceremony and all of the trappings of it and the veil, and no, none of that really has much to do with the way an assembly is supposed to function. So is there any relevance? I would say yes. What's the relevance? The relevance is that the tabernacle very clearly was identified as the house of God. Numerous times you'll hear it referred to as the house of God. All of the priesthood and the sacrifices and the veil and the approach, all of that was necessary because a holy God was dwelling in the midst of an unholy people. And for those people to have God's presence with them required that there be a means of approach. And that means of approach required the shedding of blood, the functioning of priests, and so on. But at its core, what was the purpose of the tabernacle? Have you ever thought of that? What was the purpose of the tabernacle? Was it a social purpose for the people? Was it for the mutual blessing of one another? No, at its core, the purpose of the tabernacle, we read in Exodus 25, God initiated it. It was his idea. And he specifically said, build me a house that I may dwell with them. That was its purpose. And that character of the house of God, initiated by God and expressing his desire to dwell among his people, that is the character that now we carry over to the New Testament. And we come to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we read that a local assembly is called the house of God. So what does that teach us? It doesn't teach us formality. It doesn't teach us ritualism. But it teaches us that at its core, that desire has remained the same. It's not something that we invented. It's not something that a group of Christians came together one day and said, you know, we would do a lot better if we encouraged one another. Yeah, we would. But that's not what gave rise to the idea of a local assembly. It's not that a group of Christians said, you know, the, 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 the sum of the parts is more than the individual parts. And we're all going to benefit by interacting and showing love and building up and our testimony will be better. And all of those things should be true but they're not the basis, the foundation for a local assembly. A local group of believers gathered together unto the name of the Lord Jesus Christ represents the house of God. It's his idea. Now, along with that come a number of things. First of all, possession. I'm just going to run through these real quick. Possession. It's the house of God implies that it's his it's not anybody else's. It didn't belong to the priests. It didn't belong to the high priest. It didn't belong to the people collectively. It was his. And so you'll read over and over, the house of the Lord your God, the tabernacle of the Lord, the tabernacle of the house of God, the house of God, the house of the Lord. Even in the days of the Lord Jesus, when he was here, he referred to the temple as my father's house. Now, when it comes to the local assembly, never lose sight of that. It's his. Dear brother or sister, it's not mine. It's not yours. It's not the overseers. It's not even all of us collectively. The building might be. I mean, there may be a group of trustees or maybe incorporated and maybe the whole congregation has certain legal obligations. But the actual functioning of a local assembly, it's God's. It's not ours. And it's a sacred thing to recognize that in terms of possession, it's the house of God. The second is the purpose. And I touched on that. He says, build me a house that I may dwell with them. Matthew 18 and verse 20 makes it very clear that it's the Lord's desire to gather with his people. And it is his presence. It's not our collective presence. It's his presence that identifies the character of the house of God. I'll just say one more thing before I leave that and move on. And that is the idea of a person. 
There's other things you can talk about in terms of the house of God. Maybe just one very practical thing. I'll just touch on this as I, as I leave it. Preparation. It's interesting that although it was the house of God, so it was his possession, it was his design, he gave the pattern, it was all him. When it came to building the house, the people all brought of their possessions. People who were talented used their talents, skillful tradesmen, artisans. And they're all described there in the, in the record that we have in the Old Testament. So it was the talent, the commitment, the treasures, the jewels of the people. It was all of the possessions and the talents of the people that were surrendered to God and were then used in the construction of the house of God. Now bring that over into the New Testament. It was very tragic in the Old Testament that there was an awful lot of treasure that could have and should have been used in the construction of the tabernacle, the house of God. And you know where it went instead? To a golden calf at the bottom of the mountain when Moses was still up getting the instructions. When Moses came down from the mountain, there was a golden calf assembled with all of the treasure that had been brought together. And it's almost ludicrous when you read the, the description, right? Aaron's trying to defend himself. And he says, well, you know, we put it in to the oven and look what came out. It's like magical. You know, you bring that into the New Testament and all kidding aside. While the assembly is the house of God, it's his. The fact is that an assembly is built by you and me. That's the truth of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Each one of us as members, we are building into the local assembly of which we form part. And if I learn from the example of the Old Testament, I learn that it's possible for me to have things, whether it's my abilities, my money, my time, my ambitions. It's possible for me to have things that God intends to be used to build up his house, to build up the assembly. And instead... I am taking those very same things and I'm squandering them, things, squandering them on things that bring no glory to God. Now, I'm not here to find fault, but I am here to challenge you and myself. There is no greater use for earthly possessions, human ability, ambition, enthusiasm, effort, than to pour my life into the building up of the house of God. It's not an afterthought. It's not just a membership. It's not just a place that I come to to receive and to get. It's a place into which I should be willing to pour my life. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says, The same day there were added unto them, verse 40, The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. You know, the word that's translated souls there is the same word that's translated frequently in the New Testament, life. It's exactly the same word. He will save his life shall lose it. Who will lose his life for my sake, the same shall find it. Same word. And so the idea you have there in Acts chapter 2 is it's an entire life. It's everything that I am in myself, all of me, is now being added into a place that is the house of God. And therefore it has a claim on everything that I am. But the final thing I want to say about the house of God is the person. Who is the most prominent person? associated with the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And the house of God's not limited to the tabernacle. Let me just say that. It goes on to the temple. Eventually there was a temple in Jerusalem. And of course that is the house of God. I mentioned in uh, the New Testament, the Lord refers to my father's house. If you go all the way to the very end, after the millennium, at the very, very end, you read about heaven. What does it say? It says, God himself shall dwell with them. And he will be their God. And they will be his people. So this desire that God has to dwell with his people. It's something that is intrinsic to the character of God. And flows right through all of his dealings. But if you go back to the tabernacle. Because that's where I'm dealing with right now. Who is the one person that is most prominent in every feature of the tabernacle? You'll say, well, it was Moses. Moses was the one that was given the instructions. And Moses is the one who passed them along. Is it Moses? Some will say, well, it's uh, Bezalel and Oholiab. You got tons and tons of kids being born down here in Sarnia. Any of you called any of them Bezalel or, or Aholiab yet? If not, try it. 2022 could be the year if you're expecting a son. Not a very common name. Who were they? They were the talented artisans. 
They were the men who were skilled craftsmen. They were the ones who formed all those ornate things, the candlestick, the table of showbread, and the altars. And Were they the most prominent men? No. What about the Kohathites, the Gershonites, the Merarites, and the Mosquito Bites? What about them? Were they the most prominent ones? They carried all the vessels. They all had a role. Every time the thing was struck, every time it was set back up, were they the most prominent? What about Aaron and Aaron's sons? Aaron was the high priest. He's the only man. And eventually his sons, Eliezer and so on, who on the great day of atonement could go in. So was Aaron the most prominent man? You know what's interesting? You read the book of Hebrews. And you read the book of Hebrews and take the revelation given in that epistle and go back to the Old Testament. Who's the most prominent man in the tabernacle? It's Christ. Everything about the tabernacle spoke of Christ. You can't read through the Old Testament account and read the book of Hebrews and miss the fact. Maybe nobody knew it back then. Maybe even Moses and Aaron didn't understand it in its fullness. But who knew? God knew. And when God looked at the functioning of that tent going through the wilderness, who did he see? He saw his son. He saw Christ. Everything about the tabernacle was about Christ. And I would just like to stress for us, we lose sight of this. I'm no different than you. We lose sight of this so quickly when it comes to assembly life. It's all about Christ. It really is. Yes, it's important to be a witness in our community. I don't have to come to Sarnia and tell you the importance of outreach. I admire the assembly here and its zeal for reaching out with the gospel. But that's not the first priority. It's not even about our relationships with one another. We'll get to that. It's very important, extremely important in terms of how we interact with one another and how we build up one another and how we love one another and forgive one another and forbear one another and feed one another and all sorts of other things. But that's not the big thing. All of those other things fall into place and get their proper priority when we recognize that it's ultimately all about him. And if you get nothing else out of this consideration, please take this away. It's his assembly. And ultimately, it's all about him. Now, the third thing I wanted to touch on tonight is relevant New Testament passages. Okay, so first of all, we talked about the church and the churches and what the word means. Secondly, we talked about this concept, the house of God, and why it's so important to understand that concept when it comes to functioning in an assembly. Thirdly, I just want to talk very practically about relevant New Testament passages. The New Testament, none of the Bible for that matter, but when it comes to New Testament truth, it has not been given to us as an alphabetical listing of topics. Now, sometimes in the age of Google, um, it's easy to forget that, right? You can just go and say, what does the Bible say about, I don't know, raising children? There it is. What does the Bible say about buying a car? I'm not sure it says anything about buying a car, but it does say about managing your money. I mean, there's lots of topics you can search. What does the Bible say? And you'll get a variety of passages. And there's no harm in that. But have you ever stopped to think that the Bible actually is not given to us as a topical list? It's not given to us as a catechism or a statement of faith. There's a number of those down through church history. Nothing wrong with them. That's not how we got the Bible. Not given to us as a systematic theology textbook that goes topic by topic through doctrines of God and doctrines of salvation and and so on. The New Testament is given to us as a series of books. At the beginning, you have five essentially history books. Four of them are biographies of Christ from various perspectives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The book of Acts is a historical record of what happened in the years following the Lord's return to heaven. And at the very end of the Bible in Revelation, we have this vision that's given to John in the Isle of Patmos, and he records it. The majority of it from chapter four onwards, dealing with future events. Then in between, Five history books, one prophecy at the end. In between, we have this series of letters. And so to understand the truth of the New Testament, you're going to have to read through those letters. And every letter is different. Every letter is written for a particular purpose at a particular point in time to a particular audience. And you're going to have to read through the New Testament to find relevant passages dealing with a certain subject. So I would just like very simply to suggest to you that if you want to learn about local assembly truth, if you want to learn about how Christians are to gather, why they're to gather, what's the significance of the way they gather, here are the places you want to look in the New Testament. 
You're going to look in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. That's where we started. First mention of the word church or assembly used in this way, referring to a local company of Christians. So you'll start there. Secondly, you're going to come to the book of Acts. The book of Acts is very important because the book of Acts is where this actually starts to be put into practice. The gospel is preached. People are saved. And as people are saved, they're baptized, and then they begin to gather. And as you read progressively through the book of Acts, the 28 chapters, you'll find that in each of these localities, there are groups of Christians that begin to form. And a few little stopping points along the way, you'll learn a fair bit. For example, in Acts chapter 20, you'll learn a lot about leadership in assemblies in Acts chapter 20, where Paul calls for the elders from the church in Ephesus. So the book of Acts gives us the history of the, the origins, the beginnings of assemblies being established. Then when you come to the letters, various letters have various themes. The letters, every letter, if pretty well, I'm just saying that out loud, even Hebrews, Hebrews is not really about assembly truth, and yet there's truth about assemblies in Hebrews. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Remember those that have the rule over you. So in almost every letter, there's certainly things in there that indicate that they were gathering as assemblies. But the main letters that you're going to go to, you're going to start in Matthew, you're going to stop in Acts. The letter of 1 Corinthians, the first letter in our Bibles addressed to the Corinthians, is a letter that specifically states that it's to do with conditions at Corinth. And therefore, in that letter, there's a lot of a wide variety of truth. Most of it corrective, correcting things that were wrong at Corinth, but a wide variety of truth in 1 Corinthians about the functioning of a local assembly. The next letter that you're going to come to that is specifically dealing with local assembly truth is 1 Timothy. So you'll have 1 Corinthians, and then you'll have 1 Timothy. And we read from 1 Timothy tonight. That's where Paul says, I'm writing to you so you'll know how a person ought to behave in the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And then I would suggest the last place is the first three chapters of Revelation. Okay, so if you want the relevant New Testament passages that, by and large, predominantly deal with assembly truth, Matthew, the book of Acts, 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy, and the first three chapters of Revelation. Now, the last thing I want to get across before I close in prayer is what priority does Christ place on a local assembly? Now, I've emphasized that it's all about him. But what importance does he place on it? And I'd just like to point out it's his perspective that really matters the most. There's a verse in Acts chapter 20, I'll just quote it because time's almost gone. When Paul addresses the elders of the assembly at Ephesus, he, the tone in that section is he's pleading with them, he's imploring with them, it's intensely personal. Paul is passionate as he speaks to these men. And he tells them, feed the church of God, this is the little expression I want to focus on. Feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Now, different men have tried to explain different ways to understand that. Some will say it's the blood of his own. You know, feed the church of God, which he purchased with the blood of his own, meaning the blood of his own son. And that's certainly true. I think it's a little bit stronger than that. It's not just that God purchased this with the blood of his own. I think the force of the passage really is that God became man himself. God was manifesting in flesh. And a man who was in himself everything that God is shed his blood to purchase that little company of Christians. Now, we know that he purchased us individually. That's the truth of 1 Peter. We are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. But Acts chapter 20 adds something else. To those leaders of the assembly at Ephesus, Paul says to them, you look at that little group of Christians. He called them a flock. Feed that flock. And he says, you remember that as you are serving those believers, as you are functioning in that sphere of a local assembly, you remember what Christ thinks of it. You feed the church of God that he purchased with his own blood. That's what he thinks of an assembly. And just before I close, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to that last passage I referred to, Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. I'm not going to read the whole description that we have in chapter 1, but just to sort of give the overview, the first thing that John sees in this vision 
he sees in verse 12, John, uh, Revelation 1 verse 12, he see, turns to see the voice that spake with me. Being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, he sees this man. There's a big description given of the man. One like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, and so on. When you get down to the end of chapter 1, you have at the very end of the last verse, the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So very clearly here in these three chapters, what we have is the risen Christ. He's the one described in chapter 1. And he is moving in the middle of these seven candlesticks that we're told are seven local assemblies. What I want to point out to you is how personally he addresses them. Okay, this is not just objective. It's not just the truth or the faith or the doctrine. Verse 3 of chapter 2. He's speaking now to the assembly at Ephesus. He says, you have borne, you've been patient, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Now, there's a lot to criticize at Ephesus, and you'll get to that. But before he criticizes anything, he says this. He says, I've been watching. Every one of the letters starts with, I know, I'm aware. I see what's happening. He's described his eyes like a flame of fire. And he says, as I look at what's going on there, I know that you have borne, you've been patient, and for my name's sake, you've labored and you've not fainted. It's intensely personal to the risen Christ. Everything done in building into a local assembly, he says, it's for my name's sake. So dear brother or sister, it's worth it. You don't measure the significance of contributing to an assembly by the results or the feedback. Maybe there's someone here and you're a little discouraged and you think, you know, I do try. I try to come to the meetings, but I just don't feel like there's much I can do. I don't contribute very much. No one ever comes and pats my back. Do encourage one another, okay? I know that shouldn't be the measure, but it does help a little bit sometimes. We all like a little encouragement. So I'm not condoning, not encouraging one another, but just remember why we do it. To this church at Ephesus, he says, it's for my name's sake. For my name's sake, you have labored. Then you come down to verse 13 of chapter 2. What does he say? He says, I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. See how personal that is? It's not just some doctrine or some dogma or some tradition or some uh, denominational affiliation or some name. He says, no. He says, I, I, I know. I know that you are holding fast my name. And you have not denied my faith. Come to chapter 3 and verse 8. Chapter 3 and verse 8, he says to the assembly at Philippi. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and has not denied my name. That's a tremendous commendation over an extended period of time for an assembly to have. You've kept my word. You haven't denied my name. Verse 10 of chapter 3, to the same assembly, you have kept the word of my patience, or the ESV says, kept my word about patient endurance. And then finally, in verse 20 of chapter 3, after the, perhaps the worst of these seven assemblies, the assembly at Laodicea, listen to how personal this appeal is. Behold, I, look at all of the personal pronouns in this verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. If I could just impress on all our hearts, when it comes to local assembly truth, unfortunately, it has become controversial. It's become feed for a grist mill where people can have all sorts of ideas and animosity and issues and agendas and so on. All of us can. I'm not throwing stones at anybody. We all can. Assemblies can be poisoned with traditionalism. Assemblies can be poisoned with wanting to go in a different direction and new ideas. There's no one side of any spectrum that has a corner on causing damage. The great preservative is to recognize it's the house of God. It was initiated by him. It's observed by him. It's maintained by him. It's personal to him. And what he wants from us is loyalty, submission to his authority, 
commitment to his truth and holding testimony for him until he comes back. I don't know what you think about the truth of a candlestick or a lampstick. You know, that, the image that's used there in Revelation chapter 1. I may get shot down for this. You know, the general idea is that the image of a lampstand is a lampstand of testimony to the community. Right? So we were lampstands in the sense that we represent Christ to the community. Absolutely, we should. And I'm not sure if that's the core idea when it comes to Revelation 1, 2, and 3. Because who is the one observing in Revelation 1, 2, and 3? It's Christ himself with eyes like a flame of fire. And I wonder if the core, most important idea in a lampstand is not so much lamps that are shining for Christ in a dark world, although that's very important. Philippians chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians 1, very important that an assembly be a place from which the word of God sounds, and I'm not taking that away. But I wonder if the core idea is this, not so much shining as lights to a dark world for Christ, but rather shining to Christ from a dark world. As he looks down into a world that rejected him, and a world that one day will reel under the wrath of God because of what they did to his son, he is himself building the church in its large aspects. He's calling out from the nations of people for his name. But as he looks into this dark world, here and there he sees lampstands that are shining to him. And what are those lampstands testifying to? They're testifying to his name. They're testifying to his word. They are shining for his glory. So that's the objective. Now, Lord willing, tomorrow night, just so you know, I'll just say tomorrow night and Friday night. Tomorrow night, I intend to take up two broad themes. The first is a theme of stewardship. And we'll be looking at the idea, does doctrine matter? You know, some people don't like the idea of doctrine. They say, you know, we'd rather just have a fellowship based on love. Is doctrine important? Well, the way I phrase the question you obviously know my answer. <laughs> that yes, I think doctrine does matter. But we'll look at that. The idea that an assembly has stewardship responsibility for the truth. And then secondly, we'll look at fellowship. So what does it mean? Um, how is it formed? What's it based on? How is it protected? How is it practiced? So tomorrow night, broadly, we look at the truth of stewardship as it relates to an assembly and fellowship as it relates to an assembly. And then Friday night, Lord willing, we'll look at the truth of headship and the truth of worship. And again, specifically looking at how they are displayed in and reflected in the functioning of an assembly. So thank you very much. We'll leave it at that. Please pray for the Lord's help in the meetings that they'll be profitable and helpful to all of us.